I do work with other Asians who were like, don't do that, Maria. Don't show your cards. Be the silent achiever. Because if you're the silent achiever, with years and with time, you'll come out on top. I'm like, no. If you don't have courage in your work, even if you're at the top, you show no courage in your work. Yes, you can still be bold and courageous, but you do it in a fun and light way. You don't have to be super serious about it. Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now on to today's episode. We're joined today by the founder and director of Phoenix Eye Films, a female-led film and media production company representing culturally diverse artists based in Western Sydney. She grew up in Brisbane and has a background in psychology, however, has since pivoted into martial arts, where she found herself excelling in acting, producing and directing. She's directed and produced multiple award-winning films such as Operation Kung Flu, My Mother the Action Star and Obsidian. She's also worked as a stunt attachment alongside Jackie Chan in his film Bleeding Steel. Having recently returned to Australia from Las Vegas, she joins the cast of Paramount Plus Australia's 10-part drama series, Last King of the Cross, inspired by John Ibrahim's best-selling autobiography, a story of two brothers, Sam and John, who organize the street but lose each other in their ascent to power. As a leading force for Asian voices in the entertainment industry, we're very excited to be joined by Maria Tran today. Welcome to the podcast, Maria, and congratulations on the new role. Woo! Yay! Yay. Now, we, now we can relax. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. No worries. Um, let's get straight into it. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in terms of ethnicity, childhood, and education? Okay, so my background, Vietnamese, um, childhood, rough. No. <laughs> well, uh, what was the other one? You um, your ethnicity, childhood, and education. Education. So I studied Bachelor of Psychology. Mm-hmm. Childhood-wise, I was always the really losery, nerdy kid growing up that had big imaginations to take over the world and be <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that was my burning design. You know, all the nerds, yeah, be careful. <laughs> Who's got to watch out for the nerds, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's my upbringing, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about your parents as well. Parents, oh man, when they first came to Australia, they, they so badly wanted to assimilate. Mm. They had a fish and chip shop next to Pauline Hansen's one wow. in Brisbane. Yeah, can you imagine? Yeah. Two uh, Asian couple, good day, mate. Yeah. Would you like your fish and chip? You know, Tell me about of, that because she always talks about her fish and chip shop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, uh, for my parents, it was like they wanted to fit in. And what do mm-hmm. Aussies love eating? Fish and chips, right? Mm-hmm. But it yeah. was odd because it's this Asian couple mm-hmm. would that would run this fish and chip store, but it was so good that people cannot refuse mm-hmm. not to come and visit it. So mm-hmm. it became a thing. We made the best fish and chip store. And I was at the shop there and, you know, sort of crumbing all the, the fish and watching my parents put all the chips in. There's a particular way to make it extra crunchy. <laughs> so I don't think Pauline Hanson was very good at what she did. So we, we took off all, <laughs> yeah. took all the uh, yeah. Eroded the, the competition. Yeah. 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 Did they, uh, well, I mean, I don't want to beat the same whole Pauline Hanson thing, but did they know who she was? I don't think so. I think at that time she was just owning a fish and chip store. She was just the competition. You know what I mean? That's a crush. Nation wasn't born yet. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Okay, gotcha. It was born after because it failed. Yeah, so. exactly. Oh, maybe that is the she root was, cause. Yeah, but anyway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So tell us about how um, how they – where did they come from, I guess, and what was their story like transitioning yeah. into Australia? I think um, with my mum and my – well, my mum came here, I'm not sure, 1980s, but, like, she escaped from the Vietnam War probably mm-hmm. six times. She was wow. jailed. Um, and then she just ended up here and then, then met my dad and, yeah, the – Pretty much that's all I know. You know, yeah. Asians, we don't talk yeah, about it. Yeah. Once upon a time, we met each other and we looked at each other's <laughs> eyes and we fell in love. Now we've got five kids. We don't, we don't do that. Yeah. Right? But so, we always have five kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah I, I don't probably talk to them much about that, but I do know my mum's – she's quite an entrepreneur. So mm-hmm. coming over here, she wanted to get into business. So mm-hmm. she, you know, did all sorts of things like sewing, fish and chip store, uh, 
fur place, a pork roll store, mm. and then she ended up working um, in a lottery store, like anything that's very mm. Asian. She she's there, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. My dad was just ordinary in the sense that he just worked in a factory, trying to make ends meet, and they just hoped that their children will grow up to be doctors, lawyers, <laughs> and solicitors, yes, which I obviously fail in that department. <laughs> um, and you have a sister as well who's also yeah. a nurse. Yeah, she's a nurse, but also a screenwriter, and a yes. lot of her wow. works that she's um, written funny enough has a space in america hmm. whereas really? in australia like the i feel like there's a bit of tall poppy syndrome uh-huh. going on you know yeah. yeah you know unless your, your narrative is super duper asian like it's like asian from top to bottom then they'll fund it but if it's something that's just a cool story mm. that mm. even a white person can play they wouldn't put put her in mm. you know or wouldn't make her story happen so mm. does she uh does she get this inspiration to be in the film industry from you or she also really always ah, wanted to yeah i think i must i took her to her movies and mm. i remember she always retells me the story that i she watched bridge to terabithia and then mm-hmm. she said some scene she didn't really like and i said yeah you can become a writer and you can write something better and that was it that was trajectory to her nice. sitting on that couch for many many years making this dent and <laughs> typing and and that's how her mm. path of being a screenwriter emerged and it was really mm-hmm. funny because i didn't know she was writing until one day i was meeting a producer and they're like yeah yeah, yeah. We, you know we, we can get you to work with this uh, writer we know elizabeth h Fu, and you know she does stuff and i'm like Oh God, another person in another universe there's another person that's my sister's name it's writing and i remember messaging hey there's some other girls and she's like that, that's me I'm like oh, i thought you were a nurse she's like yeah i'm a nurse but this is what i do i write i'm like oh is that why you sit at the same spot all the time oh, so you just guys never had the conversation i just about thought it. she was antisocial. like she was just something going on some sort of catfishing thing going on you should just keep it know? on the down though because like of your parents or family or was it just because it was i don't know maybe she just i think there was maybe there's a one point where she wrote something and I said it wasn't good and then mm. since then she didn't say anything oh, just okay. until I found out that she <laughs> she wrote and I'm just thinking you like inspired her to set up her career and then you put her down <laughs> the same process right exactly <laughs> and then she ends up on top with like then her name pops up and then I end up finding out that one of her films that she made got like produced in America and it looked really really good and mm-hmm. I was like did you write that? She's like, yeah. Can you not see my name? <laughs> Written by? Screenplay by? You're like, yeah, you never told Elizabeth, me. Elizabeth H. Fu. I'm like, why H? You like, it's a g- generic Fu? Vietnamese name. Could be any Elizabeth yeah. H. Fu. And it's right? funny because she's like, it's H because at least it's not Elizabeth Vu because it's many Elizabeth Vu. It's Elizabeth H. Fu. I'm like, oh. okay, whatever. Differentiator. But then after that, that's when I started collaborating with her. So mm-hmm. everything I make, I'll be like, hey, Elizabeth, can you write it? And she nice. will just mm. use it's, my sibling power to get her to. It's funny because the conventional story is, you know, sibling kind of do plays together as kids and yeah. then get into that but you guys did it together as adults and now you're making you know, exactly yeah. exactly so it's good though because of course we've got a lot of creative differences she's a bit more like you always do things before thinking and for me i'm like you always think too much and you do nothing except for write <laughs> but then i do like your soup so i won't i'll stop egging you on kind of thing. <laughs> but she does write very fast and it's funny because we have incidences where We got commissioned to work on projects, very white projects, and Mm -hmm. we wrote so fast that they said to us, it's unprofessional that you write and it's finished within 24 hours. What do you mean? What? Mm. And we're like, really? Like, oh, usually takes about several weeks to write an Mm. episode. And we're like, like, what do we stall? And (laughs) like, what is this? Like in America, you don't get that. But in Australia, if you do things too good, too quick, too soon, Mm. then you kind of get oust. Hmm. And then my sister felt like, did she write something that was bad? I just no. It was just mm. literally the mm. fact that what she did was just bizarre. Mm. And and she writes a lot of scripts very quickly, like mm. the film Echo Away, which mm-hmm. is my independent film that I made. She wrote that in like a matter of a week, feature mm. feature length. Really? Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Basically, mm. if you ever work with me, this is me. She'd be like, "So what do you want? I want three characters, one location, uh, maybe seven <laughs> fight scenes, assassins." Takes an order like a fish and chip <laughs> shop. <laughs> Can you write that? She said, yeah, sure. And then she would just churn out this amazing refugee story that turns into like this assassin action film and it's really cool. And Incredible. I'm like, how'd you do that? Like you just put together my scrappy ideas and created this mm. stuff. And Yeah, wow. Yeah, she's like, you know, I get a cut in this shit when it gets <laughs> off. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. Royalties everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So obviously you and your sister are very creative. Um, yeah. Did your parents kind of encourage that when you were growing did up? Did my parents encourage that? You see, my parents were so broken and they were so busy trying to make ends meet and then deal with 
family, bold and the beautiful issues that I think they we kind of slipped under the radar. So mm. if we weren't into the drugs or prostitution or anything like that, we've made it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, the so we, they're, 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 they're happy. You know? so they're like, yeah, they, you, you didn't die. So it's okay. So And plus we were living in, you know, Cabramatta, Fairfield. Everyone's got that stigma that we're mm. going to turn out to mm. be something either sure. we're the drug dealers or the doctors. So yeah. we didn't hit any of them, but at yeah. least it wasn't, you know, yeah. anything bad. So Well, then yeah. circling back back you said that she's in nursing and you also did psychology yeah um did you graduate from university as well yeah, yeah i did i mean i got into psychology because i actually initially wanted to become a police officer because i was mm. bullied during school for my black hair mm -hmm. okay so growing up it was it was actually hard uh, living in queensland because you were the only asian kid mm -hmm. with the black hair and you mm -hmm. know those those asian bowl cuts yeah. i had that shit man yeah, we all had that <laughs> yeah. fringe was standard. but like still you know like mm. you just stood out mm. so for me i grew up going you know what if i get picked on one day i'm gonna be a cop i'm gonna freaking catch you guys and then you guys will be all locked up ha 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 that was my alter ego right nice. and then i remember during uh my final year the teacher was like oh yeah maybe you should pick something higher than bachelor policing you know but i want to be police officer but no you know think big and mm. i looked in the list right i'm like hmm psychology ology the study of the study of psychos i can catch them and put them in jail <laughs> right so i actually yeah. thought it was the study of psychos so i ended up enrolling got into that but then it was too hard to unenroll out because i just didn't want to bother and i just mm. stuck with that yeah yeah but during the time of studying psychology i was doing short films on the side mm -hmm. making things and with a group of people in Cabramatta. we just put it on youtube mm. and that's how we kind of made our break because um we put it into festivals we then um got uh headhunted by abc sbs to get commissioned wow. to make stuff wow. yeah. as well so that's how my trajectory that's crazy um yeah, yeah. and that was like probably 10 to 15 years ago yeah. Yeah, right. but then what i realized also is that for me to be here today to doing what i'm doing it's not an overnight success it took 15 years mm. because i was coming from you know psychology i then ended up doing a couple of things here and there for the networks and then i end up falling back into community work mm. and then started teaching community outreach programs for other people to get into acting and and as well as filmmaking and then I landed roles in between. Mm -hmm. And then the biggest turning point for me was probably when I started making my own indie stuff, written, directed, mm -hmm. financed, the whole shebang. Mm. And that's when I realized, oh, okay, this is cool. And then not only that, there is an audience for the stuff I do. do. Like I did my, one of the first few films I did was Hit Girls. It was just two chicks getting over like some sort of, you know, um, crush they had on this boy who ends up being a drug lord, drug dealer, <laughs> right? But then they have to also kill him, but they're sort of conflicted with each other and then we'll see him, <laughs> you know, that kind yeah. of thing. And, and then it ended up winning a sleuth of like festival awards. Um, and and I, and then it was interesting because people go, oh, it's very, very uncommon for a woman or a girl or a female to direct, write, produce and and be in front of the camera for something that was super low budget, mm. but it had the cinematic feel. Yeah. And we shot it only in like two days. Yeah. I'm a sh very quick shooter. Yeah. Like oh. I shoot very quick because over the years I come to realize how to work with people, look at a script and even if we don't have storyboards, like really pick at it and then really just get in there, get the shots, work with the DOP. The DOP doesn't know how to do whatever. I'll pick up the camera and mm. get the shots to then go into the editing room to do post-production. Yeah. Mm. So then my work took me around the world because I was the only chick that can do that. Yeah. I can do choreograph things, but mm. I'm also behind the camera. I know how to do things mm. very quickly. Mm. So sometimes I was overseas working on um, productions in China and I'll be doing 20 hours a day. Because I'm not only Jeez. in front of the camera, but I'm also behind yeah. the camera, but I'm also in the editing mm -hmm. room editing all the action. Yeah. And it's un un yeah. Un yeah. unheard of, especially uh, for you, women. You are a unicorn in, in yeah. this. You know, so, and then I thought, oh, wow, this is special. So if I'm special, I can ask for more demand. Because that's the thing, as Asians, we're always like the quiet achievers. We're like, we do things, we make yeah. something, and people give us praise. We're like, yeah, cool. But then I realized, actually, I need to make a note that this is unheard of or it's uncommon mm -hmm. and that 
I need to be really good at communicating what we can do Mm -hmm. with the skill sets that we have. Mm. And as well as I also notice a lot of Asians as creatives, they, they operate in isolation. Yeah. Mm. You know, there's a lot of competition. And at the same time, like there's not a lot of um, work to go around. There's no point to be being in competition. And because I've been around for 15 years, I've seen the ebbs and flows of production mm. coming up and then a couple of years down, they go down. Yeah. And and what my common theme I've noticed is that if the people who are behind the things that they're doing, if they're kind of their characters kind of so-so, they're not going to last. Mm. They'll yeah. end up in corporate most mm-hmm. of the time. If you want to be really, 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 really good and really stay there for a long time, you've got to be sharp as a human being. So for me, I haven't studied filmmaking. I haven't studied acting. But I did have a chance to teach it after Sydney Film School. Probably the only person that doesn't have accreditation teaching the the, the mm. master's thesis program mm-hmm. from one stage. Um, and I realized it's not because of my credentials; it's because I'm an effective human being. So when I can break things down, I can engage with people, I can work with people, and figure out all their skill sets in a very limited amount of yeah. time. If people ask me questions on how what they th- I think about them, I can give them a very good a- mm. assessment as well as a path of how they could hone in on their skills yeah. to figure out their skill sets on a global setting, mm. Mm. not just Australia. What well, you, how did you develop this skill? I mean, did your work ethic and, and the speed at which you work come from? Lots of rejection. Yeah. You know, I think there were so many rejections along the way, especially during the time of me doing a lot of community work as well as um, – doing filmmaking and acting on the side um the system a lot of times mainstream will tell me oh maria you're kind of community you're not really accredited you're not really a filmmaker you do stuff for youtube you're not really an actor you act in your own films but you don't have an agent so i kept on getting a lot of that feedback and instead of um folding to that i'm quite stubborn so okay fine well how do i get an agent oh how do i do this how do i do that and i just find my ways and meander around it and i there's even a point where oh you need to study acting like well i don't have the money you know what i'm just gonna watch people and mimic them and that was my practice for a very long time Mm. until finally i realized oh wow there's this understanding about um emotional capacity of learning how to you know um, not only mimic an emotion but putting into your body but also the stuff that you learn as an actor can help you understand how you connect with the mm. world you know and how you present to the world the things that you really are passionate about yeah. when you're championing yeah. mm-hmm. but then i realized actually you don't really need a lot of skills you just need a lot of conviction mm-hmm. and a lot of i'll be honest a lot of people in our asian demographic we're quiet, silent achievers. We don't quite understand that being able to speak, being able to present ourselves, being able to write a very solid skill set. Mm. And even if you are, you might not have the whole package in the beginning, everything is moldable. Yeah. So for me, 15 years ago, I was a chubby oompa loompa, right? No, <laughs> seriously. Chubby. You know, but then I realized, <laughs> you know, over time I can learn how to work on my body, shape that up and you can mold things Mm -hmm. so we're not always the same unless that's how we think we are Mm -hmm. and if we're going to live a life like that we're never going to grow and we're just going to be stuck in our bubble Mm. you know and Mm. eventually we just disappear seriously we just disappear Mm. so what we've got to realize is we have a limited amount of time we have to put high expectations on who we are and just go for it Mm. And the more we are, con- we're, we we operate with conviction, and we can deliver on what we say. I'm telling you, people want to work with that. Everyone mm. will gravitate towards you. And I've had even, you know, producers who will just go, you know what? I don't care that you don't have this. I want to work with you mm. because of the way you see the world and the way you're able to command people to come together, mm-hmm. help them build the skill set, skill sets, and then get the results. Mm. Mm. That's awesome. Mm. We just want to circle back. again. Just a little tiny bit. You said that you were making a lot of films during um, university and stuff. How did you transition from that into starting your own company, getting oh, into martial gosh. arts? <laughs> yeah, that's a huge gap. I'll be yeah. honest with you. It was a lot of doing lots of little things. Um, like For me, there was a point where once I did 
my own, own independent stuff, I couldn't really get into mainstream. So mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I'll try to get into as being an extra. I even failed at that. I, I couldn't even get myself an agent, mm-hmm. you know. And and then I ended up still doing the indie stuff but then eventually um, got offered opportunities to audition and then I would land that and it would just con- still continue to the point where – and then I realised – oh my God, the mainstream, they don't write stories that we can really fit in. How many like 40-year-old like Asian mum roles can I do, especially when mm-hmm. I was 25 and mm-hmm. then like they've casted the wrong age yeah. Yeah. for this. To be fair, Asians age very well, so you yeah. can play yeah. anything. Yeah. Asians are raisin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm almost 40, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, and then I thought, okay, well, how do I – gain control in this area and also I I started to notice a lot of my peers either they might be really really creative and talented as filmmakers content creators but because they really didn't have a burning desire to create something that really spoke to the world Mm. they end up dropping off so after a couple of corporate gigs here and there then what? Yeah. The ones that really stay, they create something that they know there is a gap, there's a there's a niche for it. And for me, it was Asian action films in Australia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a huge niche. Mm-hmm. Like no one's doing it. Right. And if I keep on doing it enough times, mm-hmm. I will get opportunities. Mm-hmm. So when I kept on doing it enough times and then not only that, reaching out to mentors internationally, I ended up working with them. Because I know all the answers are not in Australia. Mm. Australians are run by a particular, sometimes demographic, and they have a particular way of telling stories. And that if we keep on waiting, it will never eventuate for Mm. us. So we need to take the risk. No, it will literally take the risk and create something that might not hit it might be a miss, but you just have to be bold. Because the things are always rewarded to those who are bold. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. People who are lukewarm, they're going to be lukewarm for the rest of the alliance and then they end up just working for another company yeah. and their skill sets get absorbed into that, but they don't really get to do their burning project. And to be honest, internationally, if you do your burning project, if you are really committed to being very good at what you do, it will cut across internationally and that's where you get more resources mm. to build whatever it is that you build. Yeah. So, so that's what I think. Whatever it is that you do, you just got to strive for excellence, even though you might not have the resources at mm. that time. And excellence can be achieved with how you present to yourself, uh, present to the world with who you are. Mm. Mm. Why do you think there's such a cap in Australia compared to internationally? There's a cap because first off, there's not enough, um, I would say, ethnicities and Asians in particular industries. Mm-hmm. And those stories are usually told by other industries that don't quite get mm. that Missing all the ethnicity. I feel yeah. you. I feel and you. for us to be able to have our voices heard, we need to take a risk to go travel down that path to then maybe position in, um, I guess, leadership capacities as commissioners or even producers of companies doing those mm. types of genres yeah. or even the dramas that we see on television. We don't. We yeah. don't see a lot of that. A lot of Asians will stick to the corporate sense because it's easier mm. because then they can go, okay, I, I do this work and that's it. And then I'll just have to find another client, another client, another cl- client. But then as time evolves, you just become numb because yeah. then you go, I'm just doing stuff for other people. What is it that is my, what's a burning story I really want to tell? Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I think, um, I think we're the only people that can tell our stories mm-hmm. authentically. Mm. You know, you wouldn't want non-Asian filmmakers making documentaries or stories about, you know, the boat people. Mm-hmm. You know, and things and like it that. has and always it, been happening. It's always been yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. I'm like, you know, who better to tell that story than people who have lived it. Exactly. From through that. an Asian lens as well. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Through a white lens. But yeah. it's not easy because it's not like they're going to open the doors and say, welcome, yeah. ethnics, come in and fill these positions because it is work to them. Mm-hmm. They're in a position where it is a position of power and they also in their way have worked hard to get there. We can't expect to be given like, an opportunity like with open hands we have to know that we actually have to skill up to to be sometimes even better than them mm. you know in terms of skill sense like mm. for me a lot of the projects i've done i realize i've been a slashy mm. and i i get roles or i get um these 
positions and responsibilities because they know they can get me for cheap because yeah. I can do three things. You can things. do everything for the price mm. of one. You yeah. know, and sometimes yeah. I'm like, yeah, I know I'm a sweatshop to you guys, <laughs> you know, it's a bit unfair. But then I realized, well, if I don't do it, they're going to hire another person. You've got to be pragmatic about So it. I have to go, okay, what's the big picture? The big picture is I want to learn all your skill sets and then transfer it to my company. My company will then have some sort of international branch that will connect to Asia and then connect to different stakeholders to then bring the financing to the make the projects I want to make. Mm. Yeah. You know, so you have to always really think big picture, but also realize that there are people who are ahead of us, mentors and peers that we can reach out. Like mm. one of my first mentors, Anthony Sito, who I, I stalked down many, many years ago because I found his email online and I remember emailing him and he didn't reply back. And then eventually he replied back and he says, please stop stalking me. <laughs> but then we connected. <laughs> and eventually I ended up working on two of his films in China. You know, and then yeah. he came to Australia and I worked with his wife on uh, Hit Girls. So you can kind of see that the world's very much interconnected. Mm -hmm. And then Jackie Chan, how the heck did I work with Jackie Chan? I made a documentary called The Quest for Jackie Chan, a bunch of videos of me trying to reach get Jackie Chan through my six degrees of separation. Yeah. Eight years later, I got invited to work on a Jackie Chan shoot because – the word got around mm -hmm. that this girl's kind of creepy that she's trying to <laughs> hunt down Jackie Chan. The secret Chan. is to just keep stalking until yeah. that happens, right? <laughs> exactly. That's the lesson, right? <laughs> stalk away. Yeah. <laughs> but, of course, you got to stalk and have skills. You can't yes. just be a stalker. Yeah. Otherwise, you go to jail. <laughs> exactly. <a> skillful stalker. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good at that. Yeah. So let's talk about your production company. Yeah. Um, so at what stage did you realize, hey, now's the time to do it? Mm. I think for me, um, at the stage where I realized coming back to Australia after doing several projects and then realizing I'm going nowhere mm. and I can't keep waiting or do I go and work for another company or do I change careers? Mm. You know, I need to learn about a business. I need to learn about how to create something that could bring people together who might not have fully the skill sets as, as a filmmaker, train them up get them to build a loyalty to a particular brand and a particular way of working and then bring in interesting projects mm. to work. But of course, it was a bit of a juggle between, you know, doing that and also corporate clients. Yeah. But like there's particular corporate clients that I would do, I would work with and there's some that I just wouldn't touch. So there, for me, my niche became like documentaries because I was very good at working with people who are – sort of like maybe the um, interviewee able to come in. I'm able to really connect very deeply with people. I'm very good at that. Mm. Like, uh, and, and, and some people just come in and they just go, oh, yeah, let's do an interview, but it's very surface. Mm. I'm, I've got a capacity to talk to people and to really feel and understand where they are going with the story rather than asking a generic question question is very mm. different and there's a power in that yeah. as well same with acting mm. some people act oh scene is angry they're angry but they don't know that there may be underneath that there is a process and the fact that when you're in an ability to bring it out of someone is an amazing skill mm. set so you can have someone who's very difficult to interview but if you can crack them and you can help them come out it's not only them, but it's you. It's it's a, it's a dance. So mm. I'm very good at that. So we did a lot of doco stuff, mm. and then it's we. Sorry to uh, cut in, but mm. did you uh, think that your psychology background helped you with mm. understanding I don't think that? So. No, <laughs> I think I, I like to think so. My psychology. <laughs> the degree did count for something. I, had, I personally yeah. don't think it. Oh wait. You know, it was good mm. that I committed to something and mm. I finished something and, mm. and made my parents proud. And psychology sounds cool, yeah. you know. But I personally think it was more through the process of doing things, mm. through volunteering. During the times of um, doing my degree, I was always volunteering on something. Mm. And through that process of working with all types of people, I started to realize, ooh, there's a pattern. There's a pattern to humans. And then I started to get really fascinated with people who are successful mm. and what some of the attributes they had. And a lot of the times they're very good speakers, they're very charismatic. And then I will be like, okay, charisma, what is that? And then I realized, oh, it's something in their eyes. It's something in the way they carry themselves. It's something when they speak, their voice, it's, it's lower, it's warmer. The words is, is more accentuated and they're, they have a, an ability to 
feel the moment mm. and not staged the moment. Mm. Mm-hmm. So those things are also something that mirrors with acting as well. Yeah. But also it helped a lot with my um, the company that I run. Mm-hmm. And we don't do everything and everything because I realize I, I don't have time to do stuff that maybe if I don't believe in a, another corporate's work, or I don't really like a CEO, I wouldn't work with them. Yeah. I don't know how, no matter how much money, they go, okay, we got this, you know, this could really help your company. I'm like, nah, you know, you're, 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 you're eating into my time. And if you don't really care about people, I'm not going to work with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's awesome. Um, and I know your the Phoenix side team is also predominantly Asian. Was that, yeah. yeah, was that just coincidence or did you kind of try to bring everyone else in to the community? Honest, I, I think at that's first cool. it was kind of coincidental. I think, but at the same time, I had this thing where I was hunting for people on you uh, on like Facebook, and then I started to watch people's short films, and then watch their sort of like the credits, yeah. and then I'd be like, "Oh, this person did this, this person did that," mm-hmm. and then I just basically mm-hmm. go, "Hey, let's go for a coffee chat," and yeah. then I'll have a meeting with them, and then I, I noticed the people that really stuck with Phoenix Eye for a very long time. They have this ability to stick through things through the most toughest times. They might not be the most ableist in terms of body, and like one of our um, one of our colleagues, she's you look at her, you don't think of her as a filmmaker, mm. but there's this ability of her. She's got a resilience, mm. mm-hmm. and like in the toughest times of any project we do, she keeps going. Mm. And and I realize I love those types of people because they can see things through and they mm. don't let their egos flare up. Mm. Whereas I do find that the filmmakers who had the accolades or they're seen as award-winning, they are skillful in their craft at that moment. Mm. But as time goes by, they actually, they, they actually don't, stay in the industry for too long yep. because they're not malleable they're mm-hmm. not flexible they're not adaptable mm. because sometimes you get projects where you're like how the hell do i do this project this doesn't fit with what i do then how do i get around it you really have to dig deep creatively to go how do i make this work yeah. and to do that you have to set aside your ego mm. and look at the project and also look at once this project's done what is the value of it in the rest of the world or rest of that community? Mm. Mm. So I really look at things on a very holistic level. But again, everything I do, everything I say is because the fact that I do see it's connected on a bigger picture. Mm. This episode is produced and brought to you by Social Wave. Social Wave is a strategic content marketing agency helping businesses grow revenue using video, podcasts, and SEO. Head on over to socialwave.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. And uh, so your feature debut uh, feature film, Echo 8, um, that's in post-production at the moment. And um, so you guys filmed that just before COVID, right? Echo 8 was basically Elizabeth. My sister was like, Maria... When's your next creative endeavor? You're getting stale. And she was egging me on a bit. Mm. And I was like, oh, my sister. I'm like, well, if I'm going to make this feature, you're going to write it. She's yeah, okay, hell yeah, let's do it. So then we came up with that. And yeah, it it started during COVID. And it had this gap because we had to wait until everything was Mm. open up Mm -hmm. again. And then we can film it and everything like that. So it wasn't like a two-day job like you guys usually do. (laughs) No, it was like literally 10 days spread across the, the times that we can do it. But at the same time, I realized okay I need to do this and I need to do this genre because I know I have an international audience that's Mm. watching what is Maria Trent gonna do next Mm. is she just gonna have a family and that's the end of her career or is she going to take another risk into making something that if it does look somewhat passable we can say damn she's she's clever Mm. she can turn something like something from very little money into something that's quite cinematic Mm. and even though I realize in the world there's people with lots of funding for their projects and sometimes it looks like a piece of crap. Yeah. So if I can have nothing and create some gold, mm. that means a lot. Yeah. So I needed to put that one out there. So, so far we've got picture lock everything, but because I've, I've got a team, even though they're on board as volunteers, but because they've learned off me that we need to be good at what we do. So now they're also egging me on the, you know, we don't like this and like that. And I'm like, oh, but we don't, we're running. No, it's our work. And I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> so my team's now even putting pressure on me that we got to make it good. Yeah. And the good thing is we're sharing the workload. Mm. So it's just not on me anymore. Mm. So my team also have a great capacity to, 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 
you know, do post-production, to be in front of the camera, to be great speakers, to also be good teachers, to also know how to talk to stakeholders. And I feel like I'm not alone on Mm. this journey. And the more they together as we grow, you know, we can then, you know, pierce the market. Yeah. We can't do it by ourselves Mm. at all. Mm. Where do you find all of your creative inspiration for each film that you work on? You know what? I take turns with my team because sometimes my team will come up with ideas and then I'll be like, hmm, if we can find some money, we can make that happen. Mm-hmm. So then I use my brain and I go, okay, hey, where are we going to find some money? And then I'll mm-hmm. go to different stakeholders and funding bodies and corporates because I'm quite good at talking to people and getting money I'm, I'm, because I, I can deliver, right? Mm-hmm. And then once we get the money, I'm like, hey, guys, we've got the money. So you know that project you, you thought about, right, last month? We're going to make that happen. All right, you're going to work with this other person. Well, let's get the script together. I want this, this, and this. And then they just go off and they do it. Yeah. And then after that, I'll delegate the funds and then we just make it happen. Yeah. And for me, I then get like executive producer credit, which mm. is great. But then they get to also grow as a director and have their directorial debut. Because mm-hmm. as I grow, I know that once I start doing stuff internationally, if I pull together a project, I want to work with the same team because they know how I work. They know how how I'm like and they know how to make things quicker rather than working with a new team who's like – and a lot of international teams, they might bloody take forever. Mm -hmm. Like I worked with one production, I won't name names, and the DOP took like bloody four hours to set up. He brought every single bloody gear that he could cam- come out of his house <laughs> yeah. and it was only just one light. I'm like, really, bro? Like, yeah. It's not just four hours of his time, it's four like, hours of I just aged four time. hours watching you set up. And he was like, <laughs> yeah. no, 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 I need to bounce this light to this light to this light to this light to then light this up. I'm like, yeah. why can't you just bounce it there and then just have a diffuser? <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, but you're not a DOP. I'm like, I don't, I don't know to your extent, but I do know enough to know what will look okay and passable on camera. Yeah. You've just wasted all this time. Yeah. So for me, and and this is when I worked with Jackie Chan, he is kind of like that too. Mm. He's very hands-on. Yeah. He's just not going to be sitting back and letting things happen to him. Mm. When he's looking at things, he's also looking at how to make his sets quicker Mm -hmm. and yes sometimes it does affect other people and Mm. it's he's stepping on other people's departments but he's jackie chan you know what i mean he's done it for so long Mm -hmm. i think by that point he knows what he's doing exactly you know what i mean so i took a page out of his book and i I said to myself you know i'm on the right track and i had a great time with him he Mm. took me on a road trip to canberra Mm. to Mm. visit like um his home and his family wow had a moment where he berated me and he's like, so what is it you want to do, Maria? I'm like, um, you know what? I want to be a filmmaker. I want to be an actor. I want to teach. He's like, no, no, no. What is it you want to do? I, assume, I think when he said that, means like, that's too much. Just stick to one yeah, thing, right? Yeah. And then he's, and then I was like, well, you know, and he's like, okay, you, you come to work for me in China. I'm like, oh, but Jackie, I, I don't want to do that. And he got upset. He's like, what? You don't want to work with me? <laughs> Stallone. <laughs> Stallone wants to work with me. You don't work with me. And I said to him, Jackie, I want to do what you do but in my, for my generation, mm. you know, Jackie, is that you want to be me, but for other people. I'm like, well, not <laughs> like you, but like not male like you, but just basically do something from the ground up, yeah. mm-hmm. build a team mm-hmm. so that we know that when we make something, we need to be able to commit to something to make something amazing yeah. that will last for a long time. You've had, like for him, he had such a long sustainable career. Yeah. And it's not like an overnight success. He knows how much work it is. And I've seen him work on set where he sees rubbish. He'll pick it up and put it in the rubbish. He's not going to wait for some other, the the yeah. runners yeah. or whatever to do it. He knows he has a commitment to also do the small things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I realize that's what I always need to do. And whoever I meet, I also want to instill that in mm. them, that we need to always be grounded exactly. and humble. Yeah. Mm. Where do you um you you're very confident? Um, mm. Where do you did you always have the confidence? Where did you get the you know sort of I imagination? Guess, uh, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah. It was because during when I was a kid, I was not confident. There was a point uh, during like uh, probably primary school all the way to high school, I was so self conscious because I had a bit of I don't know sort of like a speech a speech issue. Like mm. each time I spoke, the words came out backwards, and I had this weird stutter. And I was very self-conscious that I knew that whenever I was to read the chapter of the book because it's my turn, I would break out into a sweat. And I remember people would laugh at me too because it's like, oh, Marie can't speak, no, no, no. And and then I realized, I remember one lunchtime I was sitting there and looking, I didn't have friends, I was sitting there by myself and I was quite sad and I was like, 
I wish I had friends. And I also wished that I I can speak with freedom and and I don't have to be like this. And there was, there was this really crazy energy, like, like, I don't know, maybe I could have just, my head could have popped at that mm-hmm. moment and combusted. But mm-hmm. at that point, I then started to be this kid who would be just always around in the corner, maybe in the bushes, watching people <laughs> like a creep. I did that a lot. Mm-hmm. And only because I was watching, okay, what did the cool girls do? Oh, that's how they speak. Mm, she does that. I want to practice, go home and practice. So I ended up par- parroting a lot. Mm. I would parrot, I would watch them. I remember it, go home, parrot. Watch it, remember, parrot, you know? And then that w- that became a thing for me. And then I remembered um, there was public speaking and then the teachers are, who wants to do this public speaking competition? And I was like, yeah, I'll do it stuffed up so bad you know the teacher even told me you know mate this is not your thing (laughs) and it it got me routed up so i went to the library and one of the first books i read was like the magic of thinking big Mm. and then i based my first ever speech on that and i watched all the videos and go you know i'm gonna learn this Mm -hmm. and and nail it and i think i i got into the top round for that but again it took me being on the ground and being told that i cannot do it and finding that will and that time to hone that within me and I have to admit because I didn't have any friends I had to utilize my alter ego to say you can do it Maria you can do it. like literally it was like a little green leprechaun going you can do it and, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know? <laughs> and I remember the time when I got bullied where you know I stood up for another girl and mm. I am getting bashed mm. I would have to go home being beaten up but then also realizing I can do this because yeah. Jackie Chan did it in that film. He was the underdog. He got beaten up, but he will rise up. Yeah. And that was the cur- current crazy thing I had in my head mm. until eventually all the little things that I did started crystallizing. Mm. Like, you know how when you do a lot of crap and it doesn't work, something ends up working out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then from that thing led to other things. Mm. And then I ended up doing more things, like little speaking things here and there. And then I did more volunteering. Mm. And then I kept on meeting people who always wanted to give me advice. Mm. And it was just interesting because people were just wanting to help me. Mm. And I would listen. And then from there onwards, that's just how it happened. Mm. That and resonates with me a lot, too. actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to get bullied too. I used to get mm. beaten up. Um, mm. And, you know, I think martial arts was also something that really kind of gave me confidence. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I came home with like, you know, bruises and then my mom was like, I got to get this kid to like learn to fend for himself yeah. and, you know, send me to Taekwondo classes. Mm-hmm. And um, and then like it stopped because people knew that I mm-hmm. could, you know. Yeah. yeah. I think martial arts is a really good and a good skill set to have. But mostly it's because once you understand that you are actually – an active human being you have control over your your breath your mind your mm. body it, it then that starts discipline as well yeah. cascading out mm. and for me like from martial arts and then getting into film i think for me i love the martial arts action genre because it allowed us to see asians in a very strong role mm. rather than being the sidekick or being the nerd yeah. or being the one bullied yeah. we get to have this crazy cool martial arts skill set that no one wants there to you know muck around with us even the white folks don't want to get karate chopped because they think that we've got something <laughs> magical you know yeah. but that illusion allowed Asians as a demographic to be able to be seen as strong and Mm. be taken seriously. And that's why I play with that trope. Mm. But nowadays my career's evolved where um, not only I do the martial arts, but I realize that I need to do really good drama. Mm. So therefore Last King of the Cross is my very first role where I'm in like, I've got a very quite a sizable role and I, I get to work with some of the world's best actors and watch them at their best Mm. and also learn as I go because I also have a they they gave me an acting coach who coaches Nicole Kidman Mm -hmm. and she would also help me how to get into character more effortlessly Mm. as well as build that on-screen connection that people can't see it as acting they see something magical about it so you know that that sweet spot that you can't go oh that's great acting even though it is great acting but it's something else that hits the heart Mm -hmm. so when when we make things that hit the heart you can't really contain that stuff because people when they watch it or they hear it and they feel it it creates an energy that flows and ripples out. And that's mm. what I want to do in my work is that I don't want it to be labeled. And as I evolve as a creative, I realize I need to take on more challenges to deepen my practice of who I am as mm. a human being. Yeah, mm. that's awesome. 
Wow. Yeah. It's huge. Um, so I know you, I've been mean, circling back to what we're talking about in terms of, uh, I guess, the Asian community kind of bringing each other up, especially mm-hmm. in an industry like, you know, film and TV where we are the minority. Yeah. We are voices and our stories aren't told in a way that, you know, we want to. Um, I know another way you're doing that is also through coaching um, oh, in yeah. terms of performance coaching. Yeah. Tell yeah, us about that. I think, um, I wouldn't say it's coaching. I just don't like the coaching. Right now. <laughs> but um, I, I would probably say that like, I love being in front of people and sharing and then seeing what comes out of them as well as also finding ways to different exercises and different things for them to tap into Mm. those skill sets quicker. Because because I've done it for 15 years, I had to learn it the hard way, Mm. right? Mm. So I'm always trying to go, okay, well, how can someone else have to skip all this struggle Mm -hmm. and get to the juicy bits to then level up? So so that's why I do do a lot of um, teaching and running workshops and councils really love me doing that. I'm doing one on the 4th of June, an online one for Fairfield City Council. Again, Again, it was a, it's about acting and how acting in business, how we can integrate the two. Mm-hmm. But really, it's more about understanding that when you are confident, but not just the cheesy, you know, cheesy confidence, like, mm. hey, I'm confident. No, no, not <laughs> yeah. that kind of shit. No, that's just like, that's just hammy. Yeah. Like really deep-seated confidence that mm-hmm. really comes out and that comes out, it gets translated on, on as charisma. How do we get that? Mm. And that one, you people have to really take a very – hard look and reflect on their lives to Mm. then figure out that thread Mm. because once you figure out that thread and that trajectory Mm. seriously you're set everything that you make every decision that you make it just naturally happens you don't have to struggle you don't have to fight even if you have like three four opportunities coming at you you're like which one do i choose if you're in the flow if you're really connected with you who you are you tend to make very good choices of what the next path is Mm -hmm. and you never FOMO. There are people I know who are overachievers who are super FOMOs, right? Mm. They're always like, ah, oh, but what if I miss out? I was like, no, you're not going to miss out. Mm. Everything you do will be gold. So can't you just trust in that? Oh, if I do this and then oh, this other thing I'm going to miss out, I'm like, well, that means you can't do what you want to do. You're doing now as well as you should be. Mm. Do one thing at a time, learn from it, really feel that as the, the thing being an artist, like whatever thing, it could be a small thing, even cooking a meal, like make it as your last meal. Because when you're able to attach that with the work you do, everything you do just becomes so beautiful. Mm. And when people connect with you, they want to connect with that. They don't want, people don't want to connect with half ass people. Yeah. It's tiring. I connect with that and I'll be like, I, I just can't, <laughs> yeah. you know, because I don't want to waste my energy yeah. when people, most people are dramatic. You mm-hmm. notice when people, you connect with normal people, what do they talk about? They talk about small things. They talk about the dramas in their mm-hmm. lives. They talk about the things they need to do. They talk about the stresses they have. Mm. That stuff distracts them from what they should be doing. Mm-hmm. And what they should be doing is actually doing something that's effortless, that is to their core, to their passion and what the world demands of them. So one of the uh, other things that I'm, like I'm really passionate about is also representation and mm, diversity yeah. in media as well. And I know you've you know kind of been a champion for that in both, not just age the Asian community, but also women, in, especially oh, yeah. in you know action films. Mm. Um, so did you kind of ever experience any kind of challenges or prejudices while you were you know trying to make a name for yourself as a All female the time. action star? All the time that I in my head I sometimes played out like a comedy. Mm. I don't know how many times that I would be. You know, in writing rooms and, you know, people make racist remarks and and then they think it's funny. And mm. You're like, oh, actually, that's racist. And then they tell you, oh, but you're not funny. You're, 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 you're too serious, Maria. And I'm like, no, but that's that's racist. Ha, ha, ha. Like, mm. so sometimes it's a fine line because sometimes people are quite ignorant. Mm. And then at the same time, you can't go, oh, you're racist because then we go, oh. Dude, that's the R, mm. R word. Oh, Maria is difficult to work with because I've had 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 that happen to me. So mm. then I realized, okay, how do I work with the mainstream, educate them, but at the same time do it in a way that is effective for them so that at least I can still keep working with them. Yeah. Mm. And it's a very fine balance. It's a mm. bit of a dance, yeah. you know. And, and sometimes I do work with other Asians who are like, don't do that, Maria. Don't show your cards. Be the silent achiever. Because mm. if you're the silent achiever, uh, with years and with time, you'll come out on top. I'm like, no. If you don't have cu- courage in your work, even if you're at the top, you show no courage in your work. 
So no matter what you do, you will never be a courageous person. But the main thing is, yes, you can still be bold and courageous, but you do it in a fun and light way. Mm. You don't have to be super serious about it. Like mm-hmm. I've had times where I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, but that's a bit racist. I've even spoken to people who had yellow fever and yeah. he'll be like, you know, oh. I really love, I love it when Asian women are strong. And I'm like, you know, that's a bit of yellow fever. I'm just telling you. <laughs> like, I'm just saying like how I feel it is. And he's like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I feel it. I feel the, the connection is very mm. yellow, yellow here. <laughs> fever over there, 2-2 two, two connection. He's like, oh, I didn't realize I do that. I'm like, it's okay, but I'm just letting you know. It's just mm. the way it sounds. So imagine if you're Asian. Imagine if you were me, hot, mm. and you heard that. How would you feel? <laughs> and he's like, oh, my God, you're so funny. I'm like, exactly. So I always have to be very on my toes yeah. to call it out. But also have fun mm. with it. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's a better it's, learning experience for it others. is. And a lot of times, when my when I meet people, within seventeen seconds, I have already an understanding of who they are. So sometimes I work in productions where I would work with people who in a who's a particular age range, mm. who's a particular demographic. Say if they're older, and they'll meet you and they're like, "Hi, Maria," and I can already hear them. Oh. You obviously look at me and I'm a kid. We're talking about the gaffers, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But even like people could be like a director, could be a producer. Mm. Sometimes I feel like I have to pretend that I'm more scarier than I am. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in roles I get, sometimes people go, oh, are you really that character? And in a way, they kind of look at me like, oh, I didn't realize you. You're this character. And then I have to go, great. I have to show them a bit of Dragon Lady Mm. so that they can kind of see. So Mm. maybe I need to squint my eyes a bit more and treat people a little bit like snootier for them to realize that I'm just not a pushover Asian. And then I can then go back to being a default of who I am. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you kind of have to set it up because people will look at you and go, oh, look at that Asian. He's probably the the, the IT guy. Mm. He's probably a very great editor. Oh, they already have that. Mm. So for you, you have to call, not, you don't have to call them out, but you have to call them out in your head mm. to then find a different way to cut them down mm. and then present your true self mm. and, and, and also show to them that what you did maybe wasn't right. Yeah. Mm. And a lot of it is to do with, number one, showing them, of course, your professionalism and as an Asian in the arts industry, in the crea- creative industry, you cannot do the minimum. Mm. Right, they can do the minimum, mm. right? But if you do the minimum, you're nobody. You literally have to do this and then have four other cards ready. And it's always been the case. Every single job I've done, I've always having to come in with going, okay, I'm doing this, but here's three other things I can do. Mm. And in that way, they're like, oh my gosh, she's a unicorn. Like, yeah, I am. But if I'm not, then I'm just another Asian person. You've probably mistaken me for the cleaner or something, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it has happened. I've, I've taught in institutions where the security guard wouldn't let me in because they, th- they said, oh, look, oh, no, we don't. Are you international student or are no. you cleaner? And I was like, wow. I'm the lecturer for, you, for this school. And they're like, let me call security. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, what's your name? Maria Tran. She, she thinks she's a lecturer. And I'm just sitting there going, wow. oh, you are? Oh, sorry, come on through. And, and I'm they like, treat you differently. And then I'm like, oh, great. I have to do this next week again. It's funny um, you say that because I was at um, just mm. the hospital today with my partner. Mm. My partner's got a bit of an accent. Mm. Um, and uh, the receptionist actually came up to her and said, do you have a Medicare card? Mm. Like as if she sort oh. of was like, you know, you're an international. Yeah. And it was, I was like taken aback. I looked at it and I was like. Yes, she's got a Medicare card. Yeah. You know, I like I had to answer for her on her behalf. And it's like... Oh, that's so frustrating. Of, yeah. Know, yeah. yeah. It's like that. And for me, because I also do even action film genre, mm. there's been times where I work on production and I've been introduced as the action director or the fight choreographer. And sometimes the other actors don't want to talk to me. They're like, mm. what? She? she? Like, they'll be like that. She? And I'm like, hey. And they're like, they just, they kind of look at me and they're like, like what? Mm. And then I realized, okay, you know what? I've got 17 seconds to pull this around. Mm. And then I have to pull, put on my hard ass. I'm like, hey, guys, come here. We've only got two hours. We need to do this thing. I need you to do this. I need to see what you got. Like I literally have to play the bitch mm. to then get them to listen to me, to get them to do what I want, get the results. And then later on, they can, I can revert back to who I actually am. Mm. And once I can give them results, like, oh, wow, Maria, I didn't realize you do that. I'm thinking, well, what the hell do you think I'm doing? Do you think I'm just here as a decoration? 
Like I know the shots. I know this edits with this and this sound effect's going to go there. Like yeah. why can you not trust me? Why do I have to be a bitch for you to listen mm. to me to then at least get this job done? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where we don't have to have a stronger personality and have more cards than we have to show? Yes. Once we, once individually or as a whole, we have more credentials to back it up that we can do the job well. Mm-hmm. On a, and most of the time, it will be very low budget. Mm-hmm. If we could do it on the cheap and we give them the results that look like a million bucks, they love us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They love us. And finally, after we do a lot of that, we have more bargaining power Mm. that's how it is you know some of the top people have paved their careers like that and even sometimes i'm like oh man another low budget but i'm like you know if i don't do it then it's a missed opportunity Mm -hmm. operation kong flu was a 15 minute short film we done it on two get two thousand dollars so little shot it in two days yeah two days and like I really had to call yeah. upon everybody to really chip yeah. in to get that that yeah. done. And at the same time, people were like, you know, they know of my work. They know I can produce results. And even though the script looked racist, I think a couple of people were like, oh, Maria, it looks a bit racist. I'm like, <laughs> no, you got to trust me. Yeah. you got to trust me that I'm going to address um, this whole Asian, you know, hate thing through comedy mm. i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna do it well because on paper it reads racist yeah. but the delivery is going to be different yeah. and once we did that people were like it was interesting because even that film that we made white people when they watch it they were like ha ha oh i do that mm. you know what i mean mm. and that was exactly what my point was yeah. i don't want to be preaching to people who will be like yeah we're feeling the racism i mm. want our audiences to be also mainstream who would enjoy it mm. and then i stick a knife in them you know so <laughs> I think that's the best kind of company like guys yeah. like you know Dave maybe Chappelle not stick a knife in there it's a bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was saying like i think that's the best kind of comedy it's like it makes people laugh but also gets them to think yeah. exactly like guys like Dave Chappelle and you know, other comedy comedians that touch on race mm. um, i think they do that really well mm. but mm. cancel culture is so big right now that's the other problem mm. with this all together right yeah. like there's a lot of woke um Trolls and keyboard warriors out there who yeah. are really sort of pushing yeah. their own agendas Even behind the screen. Be, with that um, film that I made, I had trolls. I had people saying it was funded by the Chinese government. Oh, I'm like, please give me money, China. Tran, my last name's Tran. Yeah. <laughs> it would have looked so much If there was so money, please, here's my bank account. Like, yeah. seriously. like, But there wasn't. And yeah. people thought it was much more bigger budgeted. Yeah. I'm like... Mm. Oh my god! I mean, at, that, at first I was like, "That's a compliment." That's a compliment yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I don't see the money coming through, so it was a bit concerning. You know? yeah. Like, yeah. But um, that's yeah, yeah. Mm. With the new wave of um, more representation and a lot of, you know, the movement of embracing your Asian culture mm. now, where do you see the media taking this in the future for our generations? Um, you know, other Asians trying to make it in the industry as well. Mm. I personally think. Um, the next wave of Asian filmmakers and content creators, they literally have to be very effective in terms of speaking. They know, they have to have a portfolio of work. Yeah. They have to know how to work with all types of people, mm. their kind and other kind. And But they have to have that trajectory that they have got to have that body of work. Mm. And that's why I've every single opportunity I get, I'm like, okay, that's another thing under my belt. That's another thing under my belt. Because as my CV grows, I know people will look back and holy crap, she did all this. Yeah. And then when the timing comes, they can't look around and go, what other Asian female young can do this? It's Maria. So I'm already setting up for that. Mm-hmm. But I do know it's a lot of work. And I, I know that I can't just sort of just dilly-dally. Because a lot of people just dilly-dally. They mm-hmm. go into their lives, they're like, I'll do this and I'll just wait. It's all pretty flower. And then time time goes past really quickly. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, there's no opportunity, so I won't do anything. Mm. It, won't, it will never mm. come. I'm telling you right now, 15 mm. years, it will never come. Mm. Every single time I do something, it will come back later. Every single time I do something, maybe five, ten years later, it just ropes around. Mm. So then now I realize, okay, well, I just got to put it out there. I just got to, you know, I want to do something more dramatic. Okay. I'll do a show reel yeah. where I might show a couple of scenes where I'm doing a really cool scene. That's quite dramatic. I end up getting that role later on. Yeah. But if we don't, if we do not do anything, then we cannot expect anything to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately the the next generation, there is a wave of young people who are more, 
at home on their computers, game world, Fantasia, and they don't do stuff and they lose that ability to create. And that's kind of scary because when they're out in the real world, they don't know what to do. Mm. Yeah. And they get really, um, I find some of the young people I meet, they get really sensitive very quickly. Mm. So when they fail, they freak out. Mm. Not going to do that ever again. And that's, I'm like, oh, you only tried once. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, you can't expect it to be like that. Oh, but it's hard work. Yeah, everything's hard yeah, work. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Everything you've got to put effort in. I'm yeah. thinking, where did you get entitled culture from? Because <laughs> it's not going to get you there. Yeah. So, yeah, so there is that next generation after that. I realize sometimes that they're kind of getting lost within their own mindset. And the thing is, it's sad because when they don't do anything, they end up going into a pit of depression. Mm. Yeah. And they end up fighting their own dim demons, which is in their heads and not yeah. do anything. Mm. Yeah. I think that entitlement also comes a lot from social media and these success <sighs> stories of like, here's a 16 year old star who's mm. dominating the world. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, there's like these unrealistic expectations. Yeah. They don't realize it takes 15 years for exactly. someone like you to get to where you are. And, you know, you need to kind of be in the trenches and learn from every single experience that you're doing. Yeah, every single experience. And there's never any context shared with these success yeah. stories. And yeah. a lot of these are out, they're outliers. Yeah, exactly. You know, they're not the majority. You know, mm. you sort of all the hard work that goes into it, you know, for most people, it's, and, it's and the one. I notice even studying the outliers or, or the people who do get that shot, trust me, they're only there for a moment and mm -hmm. they come crashing down mm -hmm. so fast. Because once you get a moment where – you know, the, the lights on you, you got to not only have the package, you got to know how to work with people. Mm. You got to have to have humility. Mm -hmm. You got to have to have vision because as you're going along, you got to know where you're going. Mm. And some people, yeah, I got the role. And then after that, nothing happens because they didn't think about other things. They, mm -hmm. they didn't even think about, they thought the things are going to keep going. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've shared a lot of wise words and a great advice already, but mm. for someone who's trying to break into the industry, the younger generations or someone who's trying to pivot as well, can you share any other advice for those who are trying to reach something that you're doing? I think with anything, they have to just take lots of steps. That's it. And most of the time, whenever you, you know, when you have a feeling, you're like, oh, I want to do that. And there's a part of you, don't do that. So, you know, mm -hmm. people are going to laugh at you, like that kind of little little inner critic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got to negotiate with that and say, okay, shut up. I'm going to do it anyway. Because through the process of doing, even though it's you might be filled with fear and anxiety, but once you pass it, you just, again, you're like, oh, my God, I did that. Mm -hmm. And then you just built on your confidence as a human being. Mm -hmm. So with anything, no matter where you are, what stage you're at, there's always room to take a risk with your life, to do something different, to create that like that energy of moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, and it could be, maybe it could be a fair, like you might be in the worst situation ever, but I always think, in any moment, there is always some sort of glimmer of hope or there's something there that could be like, wait a minute, if I do something differently, what if I did this? Mm -hmm. Okay, someone just said no to me, but maybe if I, you know, so you really got to tap into your creative self. Yeah. And that takes a lot of self-reflection mm -hmm. as well as playing and imagining what the world the world you want to live in mm. yeah so for me all the years of getting beaten up and stuff like that and living my fantasy mm. i i would strongly suggest people tap into their more creative side imaginative side and then through that process then start building the courage to to take action mm. but without action you won't get anywhere yeah that's really valuable um what's lined up for you for the next year future oh gosh, yeah <laughs> for me i've got this show and then after that i've got a one woman solo show which is a theater production mm -hmm. that i'm doing um which is going to be like 90 minutes of me telling my story of um from you know ordinary kid bullied kid to now doing you know, work in the industry, being an action star, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that's, I'm doing theatre. And then after that, I've got another project where I'm doing performative an arts installation wow. for like a gallery, art gallery of New South Wales. So, mm. and it's weird because I'm like, I didn't plan for it this way. <laughs> but you know what's interesting? When people come to you get, and they go, you know what? I really would think this would work for you. And there's a part of you going, never done that. 
but I want to see where it's going to take me. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so I'm pretty much here till January. Mm-hmm. And then once I go back to America, I'll have a little bit of a break, go on holidays for a bit to just, you know, find a bit more different sides of me. But I have a feeling when the show comes out, things are just going to explode. Sure yeah. will. Yeah. And even w- when I get back, things are gonna, going to really, um, really roll faster. But at the same time going, okay, things are going to come at me, but i got to really use my judgment and go, do I really want to do this? Mm-hmm. Do I really want to do that? Do I not do this and then maybe work on that? Mm. Like I really need to think big picture and mm. not just be a hired person for things. Yeah. I really need to balance the two and make sure that my inner self is happy. Mm. Yeah. Because if you're not, if you're doing so many things and you're stressed out and nothing is amounting to anything, then you're going to be st- you might as well not have done anything. Yeah. So really, really having moments to reflect back and then – but then I, I do notice that as I, I'm getting older, the people that have been connecting with me, I can feel that energy. And the people who are sometimes a bit like – you can tell they're coming in a bit grimy and they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm going to give you this. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, I've got money. And, and then – they're not around anymore mm. because they realize I'm not about that. Mm-hmm. So if they go, oh, look, there's a lot of money in this. When I hear that, I'm like, I'm not interested. So then mm. they, they've got nothing to bid me in. And then I realize the ones that I want to work with have an amazing way of working and a humility. And they also have the funding and the resources. So you don't actually have to work with people who've got the resources but no integrity. Mm. You can work with people with integrity yeah. and with the resources. It is possible. What I want. Yeah. It is possible. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to forgo that. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah. You've got a lot of exciting things lined up. It is. Yeah. It is. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast no today worries. and sharing so much. Mm. Thank you. Um, where can we find you online? MariaTran.co is the website, mm-hmm. but Facebook and uh, you Google me, mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess. You got a middle initial yeah. <laughs> that you people know? need to find you yeah. on. No, it's just but the then Maria I think Tran. now what's interesting is as I'm like growing, like I feel like some like I've got other people who look after my stuff as yeah. well. So it's been interesting that now I have to delegate. I'm like, oh, I can't just do this. <laughs> no, Maria, you have to go through this, this. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, like I have to ask all these people for this. Okay. So I'm also learning as I, I, I do more things and trying to balance between those things as well. But yeah, people still hit me up for now until for someone now. else <laughs> it tends to be Maria yeah. Chan. <laughs> well, yeah, this was great. Thank mm. you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Thank it was you. really fun talking mm. to you guys. Yeah. And we're excited to see you in your new series as well. Awesome. Make sure we tune in. Thanks for listening to the Level Asian podcast. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the episode. And why not share it with friends and family who might enjoy it too? Also, make sure you head over to levelasianpodcast.com to join our email list and to receive the latest updates and get notified when the next episode drops. If you know a great guest we should feature, email us at contact at levelasianpodcast.com or DM us on our socials in the show notes. Catch you on the next episode.